Aloha class. I'm going to talk to you today about blood, that really fascinating organ that not only carries heat and nutrients around the body, but of course, oxygen and carbon dioxide. And it's aided by something called the Bohr effect, which helps heme to pick up and drop off oxygen where it's needed. Now here's Tim Tam happily breathing away like he does every single day. And he recently had a chest x-ray where you can see his really beautiful lungs and his big heart, which you knew, of course. But anyway, this is where the oxygen is being picked up all the time. And it's being delivered to every single tissue of his body. Have you ever thought about how that happens? Well, it's aided by the Bohr effect, which explains how high concentration of CO2 actually helps hemoglobin drop off O2 in the tissues where the t CO2 is building up and where coincidentally the oxygen is really needed. This is a really cool and amazing feature of the design. It's influenced not only by O2 concentration, but also this thing called O2 affinity. There's two states. One is O2 loving and one is O2 meh or O2 grumpy. And this is affected by the pH. One thing that will really help you understand what's going on is the hemoglobin oxygen dissociation curve. It describes how hemoglobin binds oxygen reversibly. Remember, hemoglobin is the oxygen shuttle. It picks up oxygen at the lungs and dumps O2 at the tissues. So if we take a look at this curve, notice that this side here describes oxygen saturation, the percent saturation, or just how many, what percent of the hemoglobins have oxygen bound to them. So in the lungs, where um, it's, it's going to be at about 100%. That means that 100% of the hemoglobins are carrying oxygen. Down here on the x-axis, we have the oxygen pressure. And so in the lungs, it's at about 100 millimeters of mercury, or at about 13.8 kilopascals. Okay, so what's along the x-axis is basically, you can think of as the environment, like what's the concentration of oxygen where you happen to be at the moment. And in the lungs, it's quite high. Okay, but as you move through the body, the oxy oxygen is being consumed and the, and the pressure starts to drop. And as you can see, the oxygen is beginning to be unloaded from the hemoglobins. So if you compare the oxygen at 100 millimeters of mercury to where it is at 40, you can see that it, the hemoglobins have gone from about 100% bound to about 70% bound. So we say that it's dropped about 30% of its oxygen. Okay, so it's really pretty simple and straightforward. Um, don't get intimidated. And this is the oxygen dissociation curve typical for the situation at rest where we have essentially neutral pH. When you see the slides that are really beautiful and look like this, you should know that I got them from the bumbling biochemist who's this, who has this incredible website and just really detailed, beautiful presentations of biochemistry. You can check it out here. Okay, um, she goes into it a lot more detail than we really need, but um, she has some really fantastic stuff and I wanted to give her a shout out. Thank you. Okay, hemoglobin. It is this magical molecule that's made up of four protein chains. It's a four, it's a tetramer. Okay, there's two alpha globin chains and two beta globin chains. And they're in these different colors here. Okay, each globin chain has a heme group. So there's four heme groups in a hemoglobin. These heme groups are fascinating in and of themselves. They're, they are these complex molecules of carbon rings with nitrogens here that stabilize an iron molecule. And it's this iron molecule that forms a complex with the oxygen.
Okay, so here you can potentially bind up to four O2 molecules. The Bohr effect involves an interaction between the chains that happens in these heme pockets. They can occur only at low pH, like what ca is caused by high CO2 or you know, activity. Heme binds oxygen reversibly. It's not a permanent bond. Its oxygen is stabilized here by the bonds with histidine residues in the globin pocket. Okay, so hemoglobin has four subunits, and as I said, it binds O2 cooperatively. What that means is that as if, if one of them is bound with oxygen, um, they all tend to be bound with oxygen. And if one of them is dropping its O2, they all tend to dump their O2. And that's what gives the dissociation curve this sigmoidal shape. It's not linear, okay? So it does tend to flip to be um, high affinity or it flips to be low affinity. And that's what makes it a really fantastic oxygen shuttle. It's reversible and all or none. But to really understand how oxygen concentration and oxygen affinity interact, think of it like Tinder. <laughs> Don't lie. How quickly you find a match depends a lot on your mood, right? When you're in a low affinity or oxygen grumpy mood, you're going to be swiping left, swiping left, swiping left. It takes a lot of oxygen before you can find a match. However, when you're in a high affinity mood, it doesn't take very many at all. You just swipe right and there you go, you got a match. So it works like that. The affinity or the mood affects how many oxygens or how much oxygen concentration is needed before the hemoglobin is bound. Now, as we said, the subunits bind oxygen cooperatively. So there's four subunits and you can kind of think of them like four mean girls and their typical state is O2 grumpy. <laughs> but as soon as one of them finds a match and it's bound to oxygen, well, the four girls, the, the four mean girls are all gonna flip and they're all gonna be high affinity all of a sudden so that everyone is bound to oxygen. Okay, so that affinity flips cooperatively and that's the all or none and the reversibility. <laughs> so what changes hemoglobin's mood? There's two forms, the taut or low affinity form and the relaxed or high affinity form. The taut form is really useful for unloading the oxygen, whereas the relaxed form is really useful for loading the oxygen. The taut form is promoted by low pH situations and you can see here that the hemes are sort of tucked away so that it's harder for the oxygen to actually physically bind. Whereas in the relaxed form, the heme pocket is in a much more open state. And so it's much easier for oxygen to bind. And when you have one oxygen binding, it sort of pulls these pockets out so that they are all in the relaxed form. So the molecular details are really cool. And I'll just tell you a little bit. In the taut form, we have low pH with lots of protons available. And a proton becomes associated with this histidine here, allowing a salt bridge to form between these amino acid residues, thereby blocking access to the heme. So this happens on all four, and it's all blocked. In the relaxed form, where uh, with higher pH, this his is deprotonated. You see it's missing here. So it's making it much harder for this salt bridge to form. And we have this conformational change where the heme pocket is much more accessible to oxygen. And this conformational change promotes conformational change in all of the heme residues so that now we can bind four oxygen molecules very easily. Isn't that super cool?
So this whole thing, this positive cooperativity, causes the whole oxygen dissociation curve to shift. Um, when we have lower pH, the whole curve shifts to the right, and unloading of oxygen is promoted. When we have a shift to the left, where it's more basic, well, you have um, lower carbon dioxide concentration and higher pH, and it promotes binding, so higher affinity for oxygen. So there is a lot that can go on within the body, different places in the body, to have the proper delivery at the right place. You can also have really impressive adaptations in many different situations and across different species. So how is carbon dioxide and pH related? Okay, well, it's just simple um, chemistry, actually. So we have water and carbon dioxide that's produced by respiration. The more we respire, the more carbon dioxide is produced, right? Carbon dioxide is continually converted by carbonic anhydrase into carbonic acid, which forms an equilibrium with bicarbonate, a proton. So here, when the more CO2 we have, the more carbonic acid, and the more protons available. So we have a higher concentration of protons. And of course, pH is just the log ratio of one over the concentration of hydrogen atoms. So CO2 acidifies the blood by producing more hydrogen and lowering the pH. It's directly related. Now let's take a look at how the Bohr shift works. We said CO2 and pH enhances dumping of oxygen at the tissues. To see the difference between oxygen affinity of these two curves, say we have uh, one at 7.5 neutral pH like say the arterial blood. And then we have a curve for something like around the tissues, which has a lower pH of say 7.2. So about 50% saturation is where half the hemoglobins are bound with oxygen and half are not. That's the half saturation point. So the high saturation curve only requires about 30 millimeters of mercury of oxygen or about four kPa in order to be 50% saturated. Whereas the acidified curve, um, the lower affinity requires about 45 or 6 kPa of oxygen in order to be 50% uh, saturated. That's why this has a lower affinity for oxygen. You need more of it in order to have half of the hemoglobins bound. So with the Bohr shift, the shift uh, is pushed to the right. And say we have oxygen being picked up in the lungs at 100% and then saturation and then being delivered to the tissues. So normally you'd have a delivery of about, say, like 100% to 50%. So this difference is about 50%. Okay, but if you have the Bohr shift, you get in addition to that, you're going to get another delivery. So let's say this is about another 25% due to the Bohr shift. So what you have total is 75% oxygen delivered from the beginning to this point here. So that's like a tremendous increase in oxygen delivery due to the Bohr shift. Here's another example, uh, this time thinking about the arterial and the venous blood. Arterial blood has lower CO2 and higher pH than the tissues, and the venous blood has higher carbon dioxide and lower pH than the tissues. So starting from the lungs, along the arterial side, going to the tissues, which is this point right here at 4 kPa or about 30 millimeters of mercury of oxygen, we have um, 
a net a 3.3 ml delivery if we just follow the artery. Uh, if you compare the venous curve, we have about 6.5. And so this example is saying that if you look at the shift between the arterial and the venous, you get a total of 7.2. So you get an additional amount due to the bore shift beyond just the um, partial pressure of oxygen alone. Exercise produces a lot of carbon dioxide, right? And so it really increases oxygen delivery. So we have normal arterial blood here um, and a huge amount of oxygen bound to hemoglobin. So um, oxygen air is about 21%. So it's like very well saturated with oxygen in your blood, in the arterial blood. But as you go to the tissues and then um, through the capillaries and then back through the venous system, we have a drop. But when we have exercise going on, we have this tremendous drop. And this is due to the Bohr shift with the acidification of the blood. So there's at least a threefold increase in oxygen delivery during exercise. We not only have hemoglobin as a respiratory pigment, we also, of course, have myoglobin, which is in our muscle cells. Unlike hemoglobin, myoglobin is a monomer. So we have the cooperative binding in the hemoglobin, but not in the myoglobin. Myoglobin has a higher affinity for oxygen. So you see the P50s here. Look at that. You need very little oxygen to have lots of myoglobin bound to oxygen. So that means that um, oxygen is always going to be transferred from the hemoglobin to the myoglobin because myoglobin just has a much higher affinity, which is exactly what you want if you want your muscles to keep getting oxygen under any situation. Right, so it goes from the lungs to the tissues at rest, transfers no problem, and then when it goes to exercise, transfer again is no problem. Another really interesting situation is during pregnancy. So the fetus is inside mom and relying on mom's respiratory system to get oxygen. So what has to happen is that the baby's hemoglobin has to have higher affinity for oxygen than mom. Otherwise, the baby would never get any. Okay, so the fetal hemoglobin has a higher affinity for oxygen than the maternal. Um, but shortly after birth, there's a developmental change and uh, it, it becomes a, you know more like mom's, more normal, like a normal human oxygen affinity. And the way that that happens is through changes in the subunits. Fetal subunits are eta and gamma, whereas the adult hemoglobin subunits are alpha and beta. Different animals have very different oxygen affinity relationships. They have adaptations to temperature, hypoxia, activity, or you know, various respiratory pigment types. There's also a trend with mass. So although um, basically all mammals have 100% saturation in the lung, how much affinity they have really varies. So if we say that oxygen is unloaded to the tissues at 50% saturation, for the elephant, it's going to need to get down to about 20, whereas with the mouse, it only needs to get down to about 60-ish. So that means that the mouse tissues get more oxygen delivery to support their higher mass-specific metabolic rate. Increasing temperature also shifts the curve to the right, which is going to favor oxygen unloading. So warmer temperatures will favor unloading. Ventilation can alter blood chemistry. Um, so with hyper and hypoventilation, that can get dangerous because then you're 
plasma pH and bicarb levels are altered beyond the normal ranges, and then you're going to have difficulty potentially binding oxygen to your hemoglobins. CO2 levels are also affected a bit by diet through the RQ. Some animals can acclimate to hypoxic conditions, such as eels, trout. There are also a variety of hemoglobins that have evolved through evolutionary history. Okay, so although we mainly talk about hemoglobin, there's also hemocyanin, hemethrin, chlorocrurin um, that involve copper and iron. A few weird animals have lost all their hemoglobins. So although all fish have respiratory pigments, there's one, at least one, that doesn't have any, and that's the Antarctic ice fish. So they have much less oxygen in their blood. Although cold temperature water does have higher oxygen solubility, it's not enough to make up for it, everything. So they have these additional adaptations. They have increased blood volume. They have increased cardiac output and they have a very low metabolic rate to cope with this. It's really unclear what the benefit of um, respiratory pigment loss is, but it is possible. Okay, finally, I have to tell you about the root effect, this really, really cool effect that involves hemoglobin. So it has to do with their swim bladder. So swim bladders are organs that help fish maintain buoyancy in the water column so that they don't have to expend energy maintaining their position. So it's like an oxygen filled sack. <laughs> um, and the question is, given that they're fish that live in water, an environment that has low oxygen, how do they fill this swim bladder full of oxygen? Well, we have the root effect. Um, so under the root effect, the hemoglobin unloads, tends to unload oxygen at any partial pressure. Okay, so with increasing root effect, you're driving oxygen off of the hemoglobin. And this is really quite a challenge, okay, because this is a huge oxygen gradient. The swim bladder is full of pretty much pure oxygen. That's 100% oxygen. And, and the amount of, of oxygen in water is very, very low. How do we move the oxygen into the swim bladder against a pressure gradient of many atmospheres at depth? And as you go deeper, this gradient becomes bigger. So here's how it works. Here's the swim bladder, okay, and here's the circulation, and here is um, this thing called the gas glands. So how to get oxygen into the swim bladder against a high pressure gradient. Say the swim bladder contains oxygen at high pressure, so say 100 atmospheres for 1,000 meters depth, but arterial tension is no more than 0.2 atmospheres. Well, we have the gas gland that is secreting lactic acid. Lactic acid enters the blood and reduces the affinity for oxygen. This is the root effect. The lactic acid is lowering the oxygen affinity. That tends to drive off the oxygen off the hemoglobin. Countercurrent flow tends to concentrate the lactic acid and the O2 at the gas gland, at the REIT capillaries gas gland interface. And eventually, the oxygen concentration will build up to be so high that it will finally be able to diffuse into the swim bladder. Okay, and here is the arterial blood going in, going around the gas gland, and then going out. So in the gas gland, we have glycolysis and proton production. We have this pentose phosphate CO2 production. And um, this is basically lowering the pH and increasing the ionic concentration. The REIT is a capillary bed where we have countercurrent exchange happening. So it's a countercurrent exchanger for CO2. So what we have is CO2 being produced here and circulating. And because of this countercurrent flow, it's actually circulating here, increasing in concentration. As we pass through here, 
because of the root effect, we are having a buildup of acid, which is driving oxygen off the hemoglobin. So the hemoglobin is leaving here with low oxygen content. Okay, so eventually enough oxygen builds up. Finally, the gradient becomes favorable for diffusion to occur and for the oxygen to go into the swim bladder. And that's how we fill the swim bladder against a tremendous concentration gradient. And that, folks, is all we have for you today.